I know anime's been a big hit here lately, but I am a sucker for video game movies. So why not knock out both with one video? This is 2013's Bayonetta Bloody Fate. Spoiler alert, while I might be giving you my opinion on the film, that's no substitute for watching it for yourself. Links to the film are in the description. And for those of you that need to hear this, this is just a movie. All stunts are for the sake of the story, and shouldn't be attempted on your own. Viewer discretion's advised. We get a nice little history lesson in the beginning, and we find out about the witches and sages that serve darkness and light. The balance between the two was upset when one witch and one sage decided to make a baby. This child was feared to bring about the end of the world. Each side has one jewel eye that governs their calamity. The child was said to possess the left eye, and if the eyes were to be brought together, it would awaken the creator Jubileus. The sages are working towards this goal, but the witches are trying to keep the creator from rising. This led to both sides fighting over the left eye, and they ended up almost going extinct because of it. The witches hid away the witch child, but after 500 years, she's awoken. History lesson was putting it mildly. This was all of the lore that pretty much came at the beginning of Lord of the Rings, and that was an epic. This is just a video game movie. At least the story's not lacking. We watch as a man grapples his way into a cathedral to take pictures, but he finds out that he's not there alone. A woman clad in white comes into the church, and she goes to the altar to pray. Within seconds, the entire cathedral glows from a heavenly light, and angels appear. The woman jumps through a portal, and she takes down the angels one by one. It's quite masterful how she does it. Then her clothes get ripped to shreds, and her hair comes to life as it covers her as clothes. It's sad to say, but this is probably the part of Bayonetta that I actually remember and associate with her. If I was a witch, this might be one of the weirder things I would hope to be true. Meanwhile, we meet Rodan, who's playing the organ, and he helps take down an angel as well. Bayonetta asks him if her weapons are ready, and he summons special guns for her. Now she can really take down angels with ease. Holy bullets fly as she shoots with her hands and her feet, and the angels don't seem to stand a chance. When it's all said and done, Bayonetta ends up leaping out of the church to kill an angel, and she lands on the sneaky guy's car. Just then, a giant angel comes down from the heavens, and it marches towards the church. He seems to be named Beloved, and he warns Bayonetta that he must take control of the left eye's power. She's cheeky with her response, and they fight all around the city. Across the way, another witch seems to be taking notice of the chaos. Just then, she takes her hair off of her body, and reaches through a portal to hell to summon her pet demon. Why is this the only character that says witches use hair like this? This is a power I could stand to see carry over to some other characters. Not being weird about it, of course. When it's all over, Rodan says his goodbyes and tells her that he'll see her at a special bar. Bayonetta goes back to the church where she meets Luca, and she sets his camera on fire. Luca not only blames her for what happened here, but also 20 years ago when his father was murdered. In a flashback, we see that Bayonetta actually tore Luca's father to pieces. When they hear the police headed that way, Bayonetta dips. Later, Bayonetta heads to the bar that Rodan mentioned, and he pours her a drink. Bayonetta also has some choice words with one of the patrons in the establishment, and he gives us a nice rundown of when Bayonetta woke up. Apparently, she woke up 20 years ago at the bottom of the lake in a casket. She can't remember her actual name, and Bayonetta actually got that name from Rodan. Then on the news, the leader of the religious group that wants the creator to resurrect comes on the news, and the patron mentions that the man probably isn't human. Is anyone here other than Luca actually human? I mean, all those people are demons or witches. The angels look absolutely terrifying, and this balder guy is some undead religious fanatic. Looks like poor Luca got the short straw when it comes to the species. Just then, Balder turns the camera and mutters something to Bayonetta. Visions flood her mind, and she hears him tell her that he's waiting for her. Bayonetta pulls out a scented lipstick, and Rodan mentions that that's something that she was holding when she woke up. While Rodan seems interested in it, Bayonetta's way more interested in Balder, so Rodan opens up the wall of weapons and lets her restock before being on her way. Across town, Balder speaks to a woman, Jean, about how Bayonetta will find her way to him. Apparently, Jean saw Bayonetta 500 years ago before she was put to sleep, and he assures her that the new world is close. Back at Luca's apartment, he goes through the memory card that he salvaged, but he finds out that he didn't get a good picture, so he decides to research some more on the religious connections. Then we shoot over to Bayonetta riding a train. For some reason, it feels really weird to just see someone like her walking around without a disguise or cover. She takes a nap while riding the train and Balder speaks to her again. But it's more of a memory of Balder calling out to her when she was a child and her calling him daddy. Just then, she wakes up and finds John riding a motorcycle on the mountainside before she rides on the train and shoots up the car. 
Bayonetta leaps out the window and comes out to the roof to fight her. So now we're just having a battle with guns and motorcycles like this is just another day in the life. Also, does everyone have guns attached to their heels? Why have we harnessed this power yet? Feels useful and also very dumb at the same time. Jean agrees to tell her more about her past that she can defeat her, and they continue to fight on top of the mountain. Flashes of her past pop up throughout the fight, but when her guns fall to pieces from overheating and damage, Jean decides that she isn't ready yet. In another instance, we see Balder leaving young Cereza on top of a religious statue with a raging thunderstorm going on. He tells her to wait for her mother as he steps back through the portal. The next day, Bayonetta arrives in a small town, and she finds a portal to Rodan's bar. Once there, she has him fix up her guns again, but this time she wants them tougher. When she leaves on a motorcycle, she gets a sense that a young girl's calling out to her, and a portal opens up in front of her. Eventually, she finds herself on top of the statue with Cereza, and angels appear. Well, this just screams trap or even just a plain old-fashioned setup. It's not like the angels are that much of a problem for her, but there's obviously something far more sinister at play here. Does Bayonetta care? Of course not. She's Bayonetta. Once Bayonetta's just left with the biggest angel left, she finds out that he just wants to take her left eye power. Then, Bayonetta pulls out this huge chainsaw sword, and uh, now I'm looking for replicas of this on Etsy. Once done with that angel, Cereza comes over and explains that her father left her here for her mother to find her, and she keeps calling Bayonetta mummy. At first, she's apprehensive, but Bayonetta finds herself letting Cereza tag along. As they walk back to the portal, Cereza falls over, and a pocket watch falls out of her dress. When Bayonetta touches it, she recognizes it and has flashbacks to a terrible memory. She asks Cereza where she got it from, and she explains that her mother gave it to her. That night, Bayonetta takes a shower as Cereza bathes, and they end up in the tub together talking about Cereza's childhood. Bayonetta finds out that she's been living her entire life all alone except for the occasional visit by Balder. When she gets out of the tub, she finds Luca's been snooping around, and he completely loses his composure when he sees her without clothes on. I mean, can you really blame him? She even mentions the idea of making a baby, and I think the only reason Luca didn't take her up on that offer is because he fell out the window. After Cereza goes to sleep, Bayonetta finds Luca hiding out on a nearby balcony, and she goes to see why he's still following her. He explains that he's trying to solve the mystery that his father was trying to uncover, the secrets of the sages and witches, and he hopes that her talking to Balder will help her remember why she killed his father. Soon, they hear Cereza calling out for her, and Bayonetta goes back to her room to soothe her. The next day, Cereza finds Luca sleeping on a bench in the park, and she starts crying because Bayonetta's left her. Luca realizes that this is Bayonetta's way of having him babysit, and he tells Cereza that they'll go to look for Bayonetta together. That would be the worst way to have someone babysit. Back on Bayonetta's end of things, she's riding her motorcycle down the highway when this holy pimp mobile comes out of a portal with its fancy sigil tires. This car looks like it was the subject of a lost episode of Pimp My Ride. They race down the highway and Bayonetta even compliments the ride. After dodging some holy missiles and lasers, Bayonetta calls her demon through a portal, and it crushes the car angel to bits. Further down the road, Bayonetta finds another huge angel is already coming after her. Little does she know that Luca and Cereza are right behind her, and they pop up just in time to watch her fight the huge angel. When they try to find an aircraft to get off the island, Cereza tries to warn them that angels are coming. Of course, he can't see them, but when Cereza gives him her glasses, he can finally see all of the monsters that Bayonetta's been fighting. Just when Bayonetta stops by to talk to them, a giant dragon angel pops up, and they all end up flying one way or another. Cereza tells Luca that witches protect people, and she's going to be a powerful one when she's older. I think this would be enough to convince me to listen to Bayonetta now. Maybe she's not just a heartless witch after all. After agreeing to go to Baldur's Tower, we see a huge angel mentioning an Umbra witch. And I'm really wondering why anyone's worshipping angels in this reality. These things are terrifying. Just as their helicopter gets close to the tower, Jean fires a missile that destroys the chopper. Bayonetta uses a force field to make sure Luca and Cereza are safe, and she lands on the tower to fight Jean. After warning that she has something more powerful to beat her with this time, they go at it again. It's here that Jean tells Bayonetta that she's the child that's supposed to bring about chaos, and she finally tells her about the power of the left eye that she possesses. Suddenly, both of them are transported to the giant angel and his play place, and he tells her that he'll be waiting for her by his master. As the big angel leaves, Rodan shows up and destroys all of the lesser angels. So apparently Rodan's actually one of the most powerful characters here. Why isn't he with her every step of the way? Him and his laser eyes could easily put down every angel.
Rodan gives Bayonetta her new and improved guns, and she continues her battle with Jean. During the fight, she remembers that she and Jean have actually fought before. Jean chose Bayonetta as her test fight back with the witches before they all died. It turns out that Jean is also the one that locked Bayonetta away in the casket to keep the left eye from falling to the angels. After Bayonetta beats her, she remembers that Jean was her only friend growing up, and she dies in Bayonetta's arms. Suddenly, Balder appears and attacks her, and she leaps into the nearby building where Luca and Cereza catch up to her. After finding out that she's going to face Balder now, they follow along. They come to a door and Cereza hears Balder calling. She runs through to see her father, and they find him in the middle of the room. This whole family reunion time jumping is getting a little out of hand. Let's finish this already. Father or not, I'd say Balder has to go. Look at his office though. Whatever that big gold circle thing is in the back of the room, I want it. Balder listens to Cereza's stories, and he tells her that it's bedtime. So he sends her through a giant portal, but she looks back to Bayonetta to explain that she's not going to be afraid anymore. Once Cereza's gone, Bayonetta asks Balder how he was able to bring her there from the past. He tells her that he can manipulate time, and Luca finally realizes that he's Bayonetta's father. He's the one that tried to bring back the creator 500 years ago, and now he's trying to do it again. Once Luca speaks up, Balder admits that he used his father to do some investigative work, and Luca realizes that Balder is the one that actually killed his father. Luca decides to help Bayonetta by trying to avenge his father. This little puny human literally throws his grappling hook at this sage, who then flings him out of the tower window like he's a lint ball from the dryer. Points for effort, but we knew Luca wasn't really going to do anything. Balder takes a moment to explain his little plan for bringing Cereza to her, but Bayonetta couldn't care less anymore. Suddenly, we see that Balder has the right eye, and their eyes react as the resurrection begins. Back on the ground, we see that Jean is actually still alive, and Luca uses his puny grappling hook to stop his fall. But Balder carries Bayonetta to the creator Jubileus, and he calls upon her to rise. As Balder and Bayonetta take their place as the eyes of the world, he starts to reshape the world in his own image. But Bayonetta gets a flashback to her mother telling her to save Balder's soul. I know this is a feel-good power moment, but I think it might be a little late to save Balder. His soul's a little too far gone at this point. You'll be lucky to stop him at all. Just then, Jean arrives, and she gets a message through to Bayonetta who leaves Jubileus to fight beside Jean. This makes the balance of the universe unstable, and Balder tries to set things right in his eyes. Bayonetta isn't going back to him that easily, though. As a sort of Hail Mary attack, Bayonetta and Jean use their hair to summon Sheba. Just when you thought you'd seen it all with this hair power, Jean joins the mix. You'd think that this series would have way more of a following considering the sort of fan service it sets up. I mean, I'm here for the plot and everything, but I guess you know how people can be. After Bayonetta is able to summon an iron horse and whip for Sheba, Jubileus gets tied to the iron horse, and Bayonetta tells her father goodbye as she fires her shot. Don't you love the epic cosmos battles you can only get in anime? And I don't mean the drawn out ones like in Dragon Ball Z. I mean the ones that escalate and end so quickly that you start to wonder what you really just watched. A year later, the patron sits in Rodan's bar, and he talks about how Bayonetta has been gone for a year now. Rodan isn't sure if she's gone for good now, but that doesn't really matter to his line of work. Elsewhere, Luca visits his father's grave, and he tells him that he's finished what he set out to do. That night, we see Bayonetta and Jean are still giving angels lessons in why not to mess with them, and the credits roll. You can't help but get pumped up at this fast-paced action anime. And like I mentioned a bit ago, things happen so fast that you're left wondering what you just watched. But you do love every second of it. Give it a shot. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more like this one. Comment what you think I should watch next, and I'll see you in the next video.